So let's get started. Well, comrades, uh, uh, again, uh, happy, happy Saturday. As you know, the election results are, are in. Um, and to put it mildly, it ain't pretty. Trump won the battlegrounds, uh, seven, seven battlegrounds and 20 some odd others, um, and the Electoral College. And he got a little bit more in the Electoral College than what uh, President Biden got in 2020. The GOP won the Senate and the House. Senate and the House. We found out about the House. I think Dante told us on Wednesday night. He said, no, you got that wrong, Joe. They won, they won the House. Um, it appears uh, that Trump will win the popular vote by about one and a half percent. Um, that's the picture so far. And, and while it is very challenging, um, it is not, and I want to underline not, the national realignment and move to the right that the talking heads have been crowing about, and I mean crowing about for the last week. Ruling class, sections of it, may have moved sharply to the right, the federal government will most definitely move far to the right, uh, but the majority of the American people, no, um, we're, not, we're not buying that. One and a half percent is one and a half percent. You know, I was trying to think about the best way to formulate that uh, as we were preparing the report the other day. And uh, just by chance, a comrade from Wisconsin, comrade Michael, what's his name, John Hop, Hop, uh, made a comment on my Facebook page in relation to a post I made, and, and uh, he summed it up very nicely. Michael said, uh, Trump won on the margins. Or you could say Harris lost on the margins, you know? This was an election won and lost on the margins. Um, in either case, no resounding mandate, um, no major uh, repudiation of abortion rights, uh, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, and other equality issues. Um, being woke ain't broke, you know? <laughs> it's not. Notwithstanding the fact that, that this was the most racist, sexist, and, and homophobic campaign in memory. Um, I mean, there were, of course, issues that, that, that interpenetrated with this racism and, and sexism that, that affected the uh, outcome. The, the Gaza genocide, the, the price of gas, eggs, rent, the, the crisis on the border, student debt. And, and in these circumstances, the fact is that the majority of the people who showed up and cast their ballot did so for a Hitler-loving rapist and insurrectionist. And the fact is that, that, that despite these things being well known, the, the, the anti-MAGA coalition, um, a majority coalition, did not show up in sufficient numbers on election today to change that outcome. Now we showed up, you know. Um, uh, we showed up in huge ways, but, but not enough to change that outcome. 
Today, the National Committee is tasked with thinking through how and why did that happen? And, and what are the consequences? And, and, and the goal here, comrades, is not to point fingers and, and, and engage in the blame game. A circular firing squad don't help nobody. And, and let's remember that, 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 that we're in that circle, you know, the circle of the uh, anti-MAGA majority. Um, but, but to objectively uh, examine what happened, you know, and, and, and what were the weaknesses. And, and, and before going further, we, we should never forget what we said at the convention, that, that this campaign occurred within the context of a deep systemic crisis of capitalism. In fact, that crisis of capitalism precipitated what happened. Let's recall that our working class, citizen and non-citizen, black, white, Latino, Asian, straight, and LGBTQ, young and old, we are hurting. And, and, and let's remember that, that, that there is a profound environmental crisis in this country, a, a gun crisis, an ongoing uh, a drug crisis, an opioid, crisis, they ain't talking about it, but it's, it's still out there. A, a housing crisis along with U.S. imperialism's ongoing support for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. And let us recall that this is accompanied by a profound crisis of governance, right? That, that wide sections of the population have lost their confidence in Congress in, in the presidency, in, in that MAGA majority in the Supreme Court. We don't trust the mass media, big business, who can blame anybody, religious institutions, or the two main political parties. Union, trade union popularity is high though, thankfully. Let, let's remember that the number of independents uh, in this country now are larger than the combined total of both political parties. And, and the truth is that, that, that neither of the parties or their candidates address the real underlying causes to the conditions our class and people are facing or propose solutions. I mean, Harris did better than Trump, but that didn't take much, did it? Th these are the, the, the objective circumstances that led up to what happened on election day. And, and, and let's talk about that for a moment because there have been a, a whole heap of, of, of rushes to, to judgment based on incomplete and, and, and partial and, and, and faulty uh, uh, data. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, estimates based on the uh, projections of, of some of the top uh, people who do those kinds of projections. Because the vote count ain't over, right? They're still counting. If John, they're still counting, ain't they? Yeah. First of all, it, it looks like uh, Harris will bring in about 76 million votes. 76 million votes. That's more than Obama, Hillary Clinton, or Trump got in both elections in which they ran. In four of the seven swing states, Harris won more votes than Biden got last time, huh? and ran even with him and the others. Um, in, in, in Michigan and Georgia, Harris received more votes than Trump scored in 2020. It's said, and if it holds out to be true, that Harris more won votes than any other Democratic candidate ever in Nevada, North Carolina, Georgia, and Wisconsin. 
As, as one writer said, that should have been enough to win in an ordinary election. But this wasn't an ordinary election, was it? Check this out. Trump, in those four states, Nevada, North Carolina, Georgia, and Wisconsin, won more than any other candidate in either party ever. That's how they won. He won the popular vote, according to estimates, because the popular vote in the blue states didn't show up in sufficient numbers. There was a drop off in the popular vote in the blue states. Now, now, now how did that happen? Well, in the first place, Trump and MAGA and the ruling class forces that, that backed them started organizing the day after they left office in 2020. They have been holding rally after rally for four years, using them as, as organizing tools to fundraise, to develop mailing lists, to engage and mobilize their base. This has been a well-organized and well-financed mass movement around Trump since 2016. There was no such momentum around the Biden campaign this time around. There was a movement in 2020 when, when Biden got 81 million votes, but it wasn't around uh, Biden, the personality, but two things. Number one, the public reaction uh, uh, to Trump's mismanagement of the pandemic, number one. And number two, the impact of the uprisings against police violence and murder. Murder of Breonna Taylor and, uh, and uh, George Floyd and, and others. There was, if you remember, an organized movement from the streets to the ballot box. You remember that? A movement did develop, however, after Biden dropped out this time. And then it exploded around Harris and the prospect of electing the first African-American woman president in this country. And, and when you think about it, comrades, um, and, and you compare the uh, two candidates, you're comparing what Harris and Waltz were able to accomplish in 100 days with what it took Trump four years to build. We're, we're talking about uh, uh, the, the Harris-Biden campaign's ability to organize huge uh, mass rallies, both online and offline. We're, we're talking about the organizations of, of I, I wrote down tens of thousands, Joel says no, it was hundreds of thousands of volunteers, particularly from the trade unions. We're talking about raising over $1 billion in campaign uh, contributions. The, the anti-MAGA majority and its coalition flowered, uh, blossomed into a mass movement again. But it wasn't enough. So, so the first reason is is that they were better organized, particularly in those seven battlegrounds. Secondly, we know that questions are being raised about the campaign strategy in relation to courting the never Trumpers and some independents. And, and those are legitimate questions. People are asking whether or not it would have been better to focus on turning out sections of the coalition that they got sidetracked or didn't show up on election day, particularly again in the blue states where, where the turnout dropped. 
We should participate in that conversation, keeping in mind that, that, that what was at, keeping in mind what was at stake, huh? and, and the difficulty in balancing the needs of a multi-class coalition and, and the respective demands and pressures that were put on it. And, and that has to bear in mind that, that it was the ruling class that was the dominant force in both campaigns. And that the working class and trade unions, uh, the democratic movement was unable to adequately place its imprint on that campaign. It had an impact, no doubt, but at the end of the day, it wasn't what it could have or should have been. In that regard, in my opinion, and some of y'all might disagree with me, and that's all right, it didn't match the platform of the 2020 campaign. In some respects, it went backwards. Like, for example, on the death penalty. It started off on a hopeful note with the selection of Tim Waltz and with the campaign's opening at the UAW, but then it seemed to stall some point midway. And its closing message on fascism, to me, without uh, being accompanied by, by drilling down and, and punching, punching hard on the bread and, and butter economic issues affecting working people, uh, that may have been a miscalculation. Now, now, now don't misunderstand me. It was important, uh, uh, vital to, to bring fascism, the issue of fascism into the center of the campaign. And, and I think that it will pay off in the fight ahead. However, it is legitimate to, to ask, what was that message conveyed effectively? Admittedly, it, it's a difficult question. Recall that some in our own ranks had, had difficulty uh, accepting the idea that fascism posed a significant threat. I mean, there were some who were arguing that both were fascists if you remember around the time of the convention. There, there was this, you know, uh, it can't happen here notion, uh, which, which, you know, that the idea that, that the United States is unique, uh, that, we're, that we're different from other countries, uh, we're not governed by the same rules, or as we say in Marxist terms, the same, same laws of motion. You know that the U.S. is the unique country. We're the special country. We're, we're the essential country, which reflects the impact of what we call American exceptionalism, right? Another factor, I, I think, is that the United States doesn't have, we don't have a recent experience with an anti-fascist war being fought on our soil, you know? that the Europe and, and other continents have. Nor does a significant section of our country know what it's like to live under dictatorial conditions. The exception, of course, to that is people of color, you know, black folk, Native American, Latino. And so it's likely that to many, the fascism charge sounded, you know, like name calling. You know, that it was a little bit of a stretch. But a larger issue to me uh, was the failure to adequately voice the depth of the frustration of both rural and urban working class folk regarding our experience of life and, and to put forward in a convincing way a platform to address those issues. Proposals around raising the minimum wage, a $6,000 tax credit, price gouging, Medicare, used for home care, uh, the, the proposals around home ownership and, and promoting small business, while important, uh, did not address the scale of the crisis. And, and even that, uh, I think, got muted as the campaign ended. 
And then we hear <clears throat> that some sections of the population weren't reached by, by either party, right? Joe Henry told us the other day that, that according to polls of, the, uh, uh, of Latino voters, that half of them said that neither party reached them during the course of the whole campaign. Right, Joe? Right. We should take note, comrades, that in recent days the campaign has been critiqued by folks like, like Bernie Sanders and, and Robert Wright, both of whom place fault at the feet of the Democratic Party's long-term failure to address working class concerns and to point the finger at the real cause of our distress, big business or what they call crony capitalism or the corporate Democrats being captured by them. And they have a point. On the other hand, I don't think it's our job to critique the Democratic Party from outside. I mean, if uh, you're inside the Democratic Party, I know some, some of us are, you can criticize them all you want. Uh, but for us, I think that we should direct our fire at the ruling class and again, focus on how to make it possible for our workers and people to make our influence felt. And, 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 and it's a very difficult proposition particularly when you're loath to even mouth the word working class. I mean, most of the Democratic Party spokesmen can't even uh, uh, bring themselves uh, to, to say the word. You know, it's middle class this, middle class that, middle class the other. I would love to see uh, a Saturday night live skit where, where, where one of the actors tried to get Chuck Schumer or, or Nancy Pelosi to say the word working class, you know? I mean, I, 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 <coughs> the MAGA Republicans, on the other hand, have, have no problem demagogically calling themselves a working class party. What's up with that? And, 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 and in these circumstances, Trump, Trump was able to run as a right-wing populist, as a, as a working class billionaire, as an outsider. I'm anti-system, he said. I'm, I'm anti-swamp. I'm, I'm anti-establishment. And, 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 and to me, the, the Democrats uh, failed to successfully challenge that. And, and point out that he himself is a creature of big capital. Not an outsider, but, but, but a, a figure completely beholden to the military oil and tech corporations. And so Harris um, ran from the center, you know? And I get that, I do. But, but, but the question is, can, can you run from the center against a guy like Trump who, who is running against the system without a strong critique from the left? And, and so you have to ask, why did Harris hold the left at arm's length, as was widely perceived? In any event, comrades, these, these are speculative issues for discussion, ongoing discussion as we dig into and figure out, you know, what went wrong. The, the main question for us and the main question is for this meeting is where, where do we go from here? Um, our task is, is to help us sift through these issues and, and, and to help shine light on the path forward. How are we going to respond to this most dangerous election outcome in our country's recent history? Now the first thing we have to say is that uh, the anti-MAGA majority did not disappear. We did show up on election day and we're still present. Um, 
And, and it's that coalition that remains the basis for the fight back. And, and the good news is that it is already regrouping. Do you know that just three days after the election, some 140,000 people representing 200 organizations gathered together in an online mass meeting organized by the Working Families Party? It's true. And just a few days later, over 10,000 joined a Win With Black Women online event, also to strategize on how to move forward. And then on Wednesday of last week, uh, 20,000 joined an indivisible call to do the same thing. Some are planning a threefold uh, strategy uh, in blue states of legislative action, number one, legal action, number two, mass action, number three. Others are putting together a plan to call on Biden to take executive action on a number of issues before Trump comes to power. The point here is that the anti-MAGA forces are planning, strategizing, fighting, and, and, and that, I think, is going to make all the difference in the world. And we have to continue to fight to be part of this coalition effort. You know, coalitions, united front efforts, are a way of life for us. And when we say coalitions and united front efforts, we mean building unity of action on issues with anybody who agrees to work on that particular issue without preconditions whatsoever. You can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, you can be a MAGAite, a Buddhist, a, a, a left nationalist, an animist, a, a libertarian, as long as we agree to push ahead on the issue which brought us together in the first place. And then we will discuss our differences as we go down the road fighting on that issue. I, I, I raise this question because I hear some are questioning coalitions in the aftermath of the election, claiming that they don't work. Or if they favor coalition work, it is proposed that we bond together with the sectarian left, you know? But bonding with the sectarian left will lead us down a narrow path precisely when we need to build ties and influence with broad sections of the population, including those influenced by Trump, as we have said so repeatedly. That is where the action is, you know? We don't need to argue with people who generally agree, but with those who we need to uh, convince. Now, now we know that is, we're in for an uphill battle, you know? They got the presidency, they got the Senate, they got the House, they got the Supreme Court, and they are going to come out swinging on January the 20th. And the obvious targets are going to be immigrants in the first place, environmental protection, the Department of Education, so on and so forth. And they're going to try to do as much as they can, as quickly as they can. The first 100 days will be the first test. Then they'll have four or five months uh, before uh, the campaigns for the midterm elections begin. And that will be, those midterms, hugely important because it'll be the first opportunity to put a break on their attempt to turn back to 20th century. And comrades, to be clear, that's exactly what they're trying to do. Turn back the 20th century. Their, their goal is to uh, dismantle what they call the administrative state, dismantle government. They, they, they want to, <laughs> that's what that uh, new uh, Department of Government uh, Efficiency, headed by uh, Musk and, and, and Ramaswamy, is all about. And, and they're going to try to use threats and intimidation and fear in order to do it. And they've already started with, with racist 
text messages to college students, black college students and others around the country. They've already started to do it with threats against LGBTQ people with grossly uh, misogynistic uh, posts and statements uh, on the various forms of social media. It's even affecting the children of, of, of our country. I got a note from a comrade the other day that said that their child in, in grade school was, was racially harassed after, you know, in the fourth or fifth grade after, after the election this uh, last week. And so we're in for a, a period of intense class and democratic struggle. And it's going to be heavy, you know? I ain't going to lie. But as we said in our initial statement after the election, we will get through this. We know that because we know that, that, that there is an anti-fascist, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic majority in this country. One election result, so close, don't change that. As I said, woke ain't broke, and Project 2025, uh, its passage is not inevitable. We also know that, comrades, because in a certain sense, we, we have been here before. It's not the first time that the right wing has controlled all three branches of government, right? Trump had it in 2016 and tried to get Obamacare canceled. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It failed. And before that, in 2004, Bush was in the White House and they controlled Congress and they used that control to try to uh, uh, get rid of Social Security and, and deregulate the economy, right? Big mistake on both counts. Going after Social Security caused them to lose control of Congress in the midterm elections and deregulation ended up causing the subprime crisis that brought down the U.S. and world economy. Well, almost brought them down. That said, we got to be a little careful, comrades, because the GOP of today controlled by the MAGA right is not the GOP of yesterday. And, and by the way, the, the National Committee should consider how do we assess that party today? I mean, um, uh, there is definitely a, a, a fascist tinge to it, a fascist influence in its top circles. But has it become a fascist party? <coughs> they, they split with the neocons, right? Mm -hmm. um, but remember, Bush, uh, Romney, Cheney, Bill Barr, and, and, and others are still there. They're still active in that party. And, and remember what happened in 2020 uh, with the GOP state organizations in Georgia. And, and Michigan, and Arizona, and Pennsylvania, who resisted Trump's attempt to steal the election. So, so maybe that's a project for the editors of CPUSA.org, or maybe it's a, a, a project for the working class project, uh, but some of us got to get th together and think through just, just, just what is happening. In this regard, we, we have to pay attention to who Trump is appointing and, and what they represent. And I think that's going to tell an important tale. It's already apparent that they're prioritizing the most right-wing forces with Gates, with Stephen Miller, with this guy Hegseth, and, and, and some of the others. And Trump's demand that the Senate capitulate and allow recess appointments is a strong signal of the dictatorial manner in which he intends to rule without oversight and without uh, review. 
In any event, on uh, both domestic and foreign policy as events unfold, we have to strive to be part of the mainstream opposition coalition and to build unity with the forces in which we have influence. A starting point will, build, will be the relations we build in the period before uh, and after the election. Here we must continue to uh, break out, work to break out of the relative isolation we found ourselves in uh, and to resist efforts to march down narrow paths. And we must continue while doing this, our efforts to build and rebuild the party and consolidate the results of the convention. <coughs> Comrades, we have an opportunity to build the party like, like we haven't had before. And, and I think that the coming days and months will prove our line correct. And people uh, are gonna see that. In fact, they are already. Uh, we uh, have recruited, I think, what was it, Rosanna, about 350 members since October. And just after the, how 244 in October. 244 in October. And how many now? In nine days, we recorded 300. That gives you an indication of, and that's without even, you know, uh, 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 trying. And, 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 and more and more people want, want to hear what we have to say. It's already apparent in our social media. Our Don't Lose Hope message has drawn over five times the number of, of usual views we get uh, in the last few weeks on YouTube. Uh, it's still modest, but it's growing. And our social media collectors have been doing great work on Instagram, on X, and on Facebook. And, and while I'm at it, let us congratulate the staff of the People's World who continue to bring outstanding reporting and analysis. And we're interested to hear, <laughs> CJ, what the numbers look like uh, over the last uh, a week, if you have them. Our party is continuing to grow and consolidate that growth. As members join, new clubs are coming into being in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Massachusetts, in Connecticut. Welcome to the Communist Party. Our district organizations are strengthening themselves and are in the process of electing new leaderships or have already put new leaderships in place in New York, in Ohio, in Illinois, uh, and some other states, in Colorado, and in California, we are working to regroup after the factional ripples and other challenges that beset us at our convention. Comrades, as you know, the convention mandated that we take steps to strengthen ourselves organizationally, and we're going to meet that demand this weekend in part with a proposal for electing a new organizational secretary. And you will hear about that a little bit later in the meeting. Our labor, education, political action, African American, and women's collectors are reorganizing while continuing their important work. Our YCL clubs, under Comrade Aaron's able leadership, are growing in a number of places around the country. And we should take note, comrades, of something new here, a maturation in the political and ideological outlook of our youth, in the leadership of our clubs in DC, Philly, and New York, and other places that, that will help, I think, lay the basis for building a national organization and having a YCL convention. The party and the YCL are united ideologically and also with respect to our strategic line that we more so than we have been in many years. We support the YCL and the YCL supports the party 
And comrades, that's a combination that can't be beat. So in closing, comrades, we say again, we will get through this. Like we got through the Palmer raids, like we got through the Klan when we were organizing in the Deep South, like, like we got through the Cold War and Joe McCarthy, like we got through Reagan and Bush, like we got through Trump 1.0, and we will get through this second edition. Project 2025 is not inevitable. You cannot keep this good party and this good YCL and our working class down. Let our conversation today begin. Thank you very much. <laughs>